Well, we're going to stab the enemy today. Amen. And we're going to wound. I know this unequivocally, that the enemy has never seen a church like being raised up right now. We are a surprise to the devil. And I think I got some Kleenex in my eye here. This is what happens when you cry too much. Um, I am an uh, oxymoron. Uh, I'm a weeper, and yet I am a warrior. Uh, I want you to stand with me. We're going to read uh, today out of the book of Luke. Pastor Todd, great to have you and Michelle with us today. Um, the book of Luke, chapter 22. <clears throat> And uh, I'm going to release a rhema word to you today, I believe, that will, will change the way that you live in your life. Um, this has been a very uh, debatable passage of Scripture. Lots of people don't understand what it means when they read it, but I think by the help of the Holy Ghost today, I can give you some insight into what the writer is saying. Uh, the, the 22nd chapter of Luke is the setting where Jesus is talking about what is getting ready to happen to him, his suffering, his crucifixion, his betrayal, and that he is going to die and be resurrected again. At the end of his discourse in that room where they've had the Last Supper, uh, in verse 35, he said unto them, when I sent you without purse and scrip or money and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, nothing. Then he said unto them, but now he that hath the purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. He that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you that it is written, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me, and he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. God bless you. Could be seated. Jesus is talking to them, and he's reminding them that as long as I was with you, he said, I want you to remember this. You never lacked anything. And sometimes God needs to remind us that as long as God is with us, he will meet all of our need according to his riches and glory. <clears throat> then the Lord begins to talk to them, and he said, but I'm getting ready to go away. And he said, you need to go buy a sword. And a little later on, we read it, and they said, well, Lord, here's two swords. And he said, it's enough. He wasn't speaking about two natural swords would be enough. I think at that point, they were missing what he was saying in the spirit, and he was looking at them and say, enough of that kind of talk. Because not long after that, the Bible says that Peter drew a sword and cut the ear off of Malchus. And Jesus looked at Peter. He said, put up your sword, because he who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. So the Lord wasn't talking here in terms of a natural weapon. When you study the life of Jesus and you listen to his dissertations and his teachings, you will very quickly realize that Jesus loved metaphors. And that many times he would use metaphors to release a scriptural principle. For example, when he said, if thy right eye offends thee, pluck it out. He was not telling us that if you have a problem with looking at something you shouldn't, men, you need to pull your, ear, your eye out of your head. Because that would not solve the problem. Because the problem is not in the eye, it's in the heart. He said, if thy right hand offend thee, then cut it off. He wasn't saying that. He was using a metaphor. So the Lord is speaking here, and he's trying to break a truth to them. What he's saying is, as long as I was with you, I was your protection. 
Never in one scripture of the Gospels does it ever say that any disciple was ever harmed when they were with Jesus. You can't find it any place. It never says, and Jesus was teaching, and a man came up and stabbed Philip, and he died. It's not in there. Why? Because they were in and under the protection of a divine protector. And so I'm going to bring you through a little journey here, but the Lord is looking in them, and he is saying, now listen, guys. He said, I'm leaving. And he said, when I leave, I'm not going to be here any longer to be able to protect you. So he said, you need to buy yourself a sword because you're going to go into battle. And if you do not have a weapon, you are going to be defeated. So the Lord looked at him and he said, you didn't need a sword before because I was your sword. I was your protection. But he said, I'm physically leaving. So I'm telling you that you need a weapon for battle. Now I want to read a verse that you're very familiar with. This lists the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And uh, verse 11, it says, you need to put on the whole armor of God. And the, and the reason why is this, so you can stand against the wiles of the devil. The devil is very, uh, he disguises himself. He is very, very gifted in the ways of coming against you. He uses tricks. Verse 12, you and I are not wrestling against flesh and blood. For us, as white people, the American Indian is not our, our enemy. For black Americans, the white person is not your enemy. What we are dealing with in America are spiritual enemies. But the media will try to bring them into a natural realm and put a label on them. And he, if he can get you to shift from the spirit realm into the natural realm and fight hatred with hatred, then we're going to lose because our weapons are not natural weapons for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we are wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So the Lord begins to the writer Paul, he begins to talk about the armor of God, and he lists them to. He says, uh, the loins girt about with truth, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to stop the fiery darts of the wicked, the helmet of salvation. And then he says this, the sword of the Spirit, and then he doesn't speak in metaphors. He says, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. That's why David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The reason so many believers are weak today is because they do not put themselves in the word of the Lord. You need to read the word in the morning. You need to read it at night. If you are a Christian and you can go weeks without reading the Bible, then don't complain when you are defeated. You fall on your face. Temptation overtakes you because you will never defeat the powers of darkness unless you are bleeding the word of the Lord. That when the enemy comes against you, hallelujah, that the word of God begins to rise up in you. When he begins to lie against you and he says you're sick, you can say, but the word says I am healed. Your children will go to hell, but the word says, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. When he says you're going to lose your mind, but we shall be led forth by our peace for he gives us not the spirit of fear but he gives us the power of love and of a sound mind that you're going to die young the word says he preserves the life of the righteous you're going to go bankrupt and you're going to lose everything you got but the word says I will rebuke the devourer for your sake you're not never going to be blessed but I the word says I will cause it to be heaped up running over pressed down shall men give it to your bosom so no wonder hallelujah 
God calls the word the sword. Incidentally, it is the only offensive weapon that you and I have. Even the shield of faith is not an offensive weapon. You hold the shield of faith here. And that covers that left eye. See, that's why we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith because when you hold up the shield of faith, it makes your left eye blind in the natural. You can't see. All you can see is faith. But in this hand, your right eye can see what's in this hand. The sword of the Lord. That's the offensive weapon. This will stop what's coming in. Faith can stop stuff you cannot see. Hallelujah. But the sword of the Lord begins to... And it begins to cut down the powers of darkness. See, what's happened in the earth, in America especially, the church has had faith, but we've had no sword. And no wonder our government's convoluted and filled with betrayal and traitors and sin and ungodliness. And the media's been overrun. It's because there has been no offensive weapon in the house of the Lord. I got news for hell today. There is a church that is rising up, and we're not coming defenseless our hands are not empty but we are in the hand of the almighty hand of God and there is a sword of the Lord and we cut in the atmosphere we come against the enemy we don't sit back and hide out but we charge by the power of darkness and we pull down the strongholds of hell See, when you get the word of God in you, you will not be intimidated. Hallelujah. We are not intimidated. This is one preacher you cannot shut up. You cannot intimidate. You cannot dare and come against me because I am a voice of the Holy Ghost in this hour. And as I loose the word of the Lord today, I command cancer. I mortally wound cancer. Oh, in this building, to all the online members of this church, I bind every demon and I sever them by the power of the word of the Lord. I lose hallelujah health. I lose joy. I lose President Trump in the name of the Lord. I lose in this house today a release of the power of the Holy Ghost. Why is the Word of God so powerful? This book right here, why is it so powerful? Because Apostle John had a revelation of it. He starts off his book. It's the only gospel that is not a synoptic gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic gospels. They're they're similar in their style and how they write. But not John. He starts off... Luke starts off with the natural birth of Jesus. John starts off with the eternal birth of Jesus. In the beginning was the word. Not when they call for taxes in Bethlehem, but before man ever existed, before devils ever were in creation. In the beginning, he says, was the word. And the word was God, and the word, hallelujah, was manifested in the flesh. Then he skips over to John 14, and Jesus said this. He said, I am truth. And then he jumps another three chapters in John 17 and 17, and then he says this. Thy word is truth see how God connects it first it's the word hallelujah then it's truth and then he says thy word is truth so then we come back to Jesus telling them he says I need you to buy a sword he wasn't telling us you know I I'm all for holding government offices as Christians and all of that I just think we might be a little bit late This, 
what's wrong in our nation is not going to be fixed by getting a few people as mayors and governors in the United States of America or even as congressmen. This is a spiritual issue. So it has to be dealt with on a spiritual battlefield. So God needs warriors in this hour. And so the Lord begins, I think, the scripture that was written all the way back into the Old Testament. Proverbs 23 and 23 just simply says this. Buy the truth and sell it not. What's he saying? Same thing Jesus said. You need to go buy a sword. See, the Bible says that about Christ, it said the church is the only thing that Jesus ever bought. Said he purchased the church with his own blood. But I'm going to tell you what. Holy Ghost is free. Healing is free. But according to the scripture, you got to buy the word. In other words, there has to be something given in exchange for the word of the Lord. There has to be a love for the word. There has to be a pursuit of the word. There has to be a he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. Hallelujah. And what God is doing in this hour, I, I pray probably for, for four or five years when we were in the other location, I would walk in that building, I would walk at the park, and I would pray. And... Um, I knew that we had the presence of God in our church. I knew that I could preach under the anointing. I just couldn't figure out why nobody came. Visitors would come, and they would say, we can't understand why your church ain't filled. And I began to pray. I said, Lord, I know that in a 100-mile radius, there is a remnant. That's why I love you being here today, remnant ministry. But I would say it in prayer. I says, I need you to gather the remnant from Lebanon and Murfreesboro, from way out, hallelujah, in Franklin and Columbia, way up, hallelujah, into, into Portland and Springfield, way over, over into Lebanon, and, and begin to gather the remnant under the roof. Now we are beginning to see this. You know what's in this building today? You know what's watching online? It is a remnant of men and women that God is marshalling together. And he's bringing them into one place. We're going to raise the roof on the 4th of July. If the Grand Ole Opry thinks they've had some great times there, you wait till we lose Holy Ghost anointed men, women, and singers in that building. We're going to saturate the atmosphere that the next time the Grand Ole Opry starts and singers walk out on the stage they're gonna go what what is this what do I feel what's going on is because we're gonna loose in the atmosphere the power and of the word of the Lord so the Lord is leading up to something he is very uh, emphatic about this principle he is saying this you need to get a sword you need to buy a sword because it is the only thing that you will ever have at your disposal that can defeat the powers of darkness. From cancer to incest, it has authority over them. I was listening to, to, to them talk about healing. You know, the medical field is able to target certain diseases, but they will have a medicine, but it can only target one particular sickness. But the blood of Jesus, hallelujah, it's one size fits all. It doesn't matter if you come in with leukemia or you come in with cancer. It doesn't matter if you're demon possessed or you're fighting depression. The blood of Jesus, hallelujah, is an all-inclusive antidote for the very foul powers of darkness that are invading the human body. And when you begin to release the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, what are you doing? You are with a sword and you are cutting down the very things that the enemy has done the devil is not used to being attacked this is why churches don't practice deliverance because that involves being offensive they just want to sit back and say if he'll leave us alone we'll leave him alone we are not here to leave the devil alone if the enemy thinks 
that after six months that we're going to roll over and die and say, well, I, I guess that's just the way it is and we can't change that. And no, sir. There is a remnant in the United States of America, in Australia, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in England, all across the world. There is a remnant that is not bowing down and not listening to the enemy that says, we won, you can't do anything about it. But I am releasing right now in the heavens a word of the Lord. I have unsheathed the sword in the Holy Ghost. And even right now, saith the Lord, the angels of God are beginning to wield the sword of the word of God. There are even strongholds, saith God, in this hour that are being pulled down by the power of the Lord. Hear me, saith the Lord, for the reports of the victory of the evil are going to become fewer and fewer. And the reports of the victory and the turnaround is going to become more and more and more. For the plowman's going to overtake the reaper, saith God. For there is a release of the Spirit of the Lord in this nation. For the enemies come against you because there is a great outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord. Know this, that you are privileged in this hour to you, your own eyes to behold the greatest revival that the world will ever see. Hold on, saith God. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I lose hope in you. I lose faith in you. I lose the anointing in you, and you will receive of the powers of God. Prophets understood this because Isaiah 49 and 2, he wrote this. He says, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. So now we're getting a little bit more concise on where God's going. The same writer in Proverbs wrote this verse that we all are familiar with. But he said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So, on the day of Pentecost, when Jesus left the earth, the disciples went into hiding. For 40 days, Jesus was on the earth, and they hung out with him. The Bible says that he showed himself alive by many infallible passions, or many, uh, many signs that could not be debated. But... The last 10 days before Pentecost, Jesus ascended on the Mount of Olives. Soon as he left, as he's leaving, he told them, he said, you need to go to Jerusalem. You need to hang out there and stay there until you be endued. He didn't say, okay, guys, now it's time to go evangelize the earth. Why? Because he knew that they were not equipped because they had no sword. Because the sword was being, or being translated. He was going up into heaven. So for 10 days, the church, defenseless, is in the upper room, quarantined. That's where they were. <clears throat> and on the 10th day, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind. What happens? The Bible says it fills the whole house where they are sitting, and there appears to them cloven tongues like fire, and it sits upon each of them, and what happens? They all begin to speak the word. At that moment, God puts a sword in their mouth, and now they are equipped to take on any kind of conflict that they want to throw out them because they are no longer defenseless, but now they have a sword in their mouth. This is why Isaiah said, he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. From that day on, everything began to change because the sword can speak life or death. All right? In fact, the very first time that you ever read about a sword in the Bible is when sin enters into the Garden of Eden 
And God looks at Adam and Eve and the devil, and he evicts them from his holy presence. And then the scripture says, I think it's in the third chapter of Genesis, the scripture says that God took cherubims with flaming swords. And what were they doing? The Bible said they were not... They were not going outside of the garden, but it said they were guarding the tree of life so it could be preserved to be released on the day of Pentecost. Because on the day of Pentecost, the life, hallelujah, that was in the blood was released in the atmosphere and it began to come out of their mouth and every nation said we hear them speak the wondrous works of God in our own languages what was going on there was a sword being released out of heaven where God was saying now you can guard what comes out of your mouth this is why the Lord's hallelujah talks about this it says in Hebrews the word of God is quick and powerful and it is sharper than any two-edged sword sword what he's saying is the scripture says whatever you bind God will bind and whatever you loose God will loose when you take the sword of the Lord and you swipe it through the air in the kingdom of darkness on one swoop you are killing the enemy you are binding him so he cannot manifest and then you go this way and you are cutting loose hallelujah you're an inheritance and your purpose sharper than any two-edged sword this way I wound the enemy this way I loose the glory of God in our lives and in the atmosphere this way Jack I kill cancer this way hallelujah I lose your health in the name of the Lord this way we stop this come going on in our nature and this way we lose the glory of God and we lose righteousness and justice in the land by the power of the Lord no wonder God said it's praise or it's prophets and Judah that are the first to go into the battle. Why? Because both of them are speaking things that have not yet happened. Judah means praise. What was Jasmine doing up here leading us? We were praising God. We were loosing a swipe of the sword. We were cutting through the atmosphere that the enemy could not touch us as we go into the word of the Lord. That's why God has loose prophets in the earth right now. It's because they are cutting through the atmosphere against the lies and the debauchery and the deceit that has been going on. And thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. What is that? That is the prophetic word of God cutting through the atmosphere. It's not I or anybody else that is speaking. It is the sword of the Lord. No wonder on the 4th of July we are going to loose the sword of the Lord. And the year that we celebrate the liberty of this nation, we are going to cut back through and release, hallelujah, in the atmosphere the glory and the power of God. Deuteronomy 33 and 29 talks about this. He said, is, he said, Israel, the Lord is the sword of thy excellency. It's been so long since Christians were offensive. You don't have to have a sword to take up an offering. You know, in reality, um, the scriptures that everybody, all the preachers use to take up big offerings is in the Old Testament. It's funny, though, that in a New Testament time, that unless you really go deep and you can go into Hebrews and talk about Melchizedek and he was a priest not after the order of Levite and even, even Abraham paid tithes unto him and there is a teaching there but it's funny how the modern church for a lot of preachers 
we say that tongues is over and shouting's over and holiness is over, but somehow we can resurrect a verse out of the Old Testament. <laughs> Offerings ain't over. Isn't that amazing? It don't matter what denomination you're in. Offerings somehow survived everything. The disciples are dead. Jesus is dead. Bible's no antiquity, but offerings are around. You can have five services on a Sunday, and they can forget a lot of things, but they will not forget the offering. This is why we don't major on money in this church. If God births it, then let God pay for it. I thank God for all of you that tithe and all of you that sow online, but you are not my source, and I am not your source. God is our source. And the Lord is in this hour. This is an hour right now. If you watched my podcast last Wednesday, this is an hour where God is going to take the wealth of ungodly men that have been caretakers of him, and he is going to release it into the body of Christ. <clears throat> So I want to I just give you a few examples about the word of the Lord, the sword of God, that your mouth is your sword. And either you can commit suicide with it or you can live victorious with it. But death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so many of us, me included over the years before I got a revelation of it, I let the devil wound me with my own mouth. The scripture says of Gideon, he says, I'm the least of the tribe, least of my father's house. I'm not trained in war. And you know the story. And God whittles his army down from, I think, 32,000 to 300 men. And the Bible says that, that he's going to battle against, I think, the Amalekites and the Midianites. And the Bible said, you know, there's like the sand of the seashore. There's so many of them. And here they're standing down there, and the Lord says, make a circle of 300 men around it and have a, a trumpet and a pitcher and a lamp. That's what they went to battle with. And they're standing around at the nighttime and the Lord says, when I tell you to do this, break the pitchers, let the lamp shine, blow the trumpet, but say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. What was he declaring? When you say that, you are going to release the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What does the Word of God do? It creates. In the beginning, God said, God said, God said, there was, there was, there was. What does the Word do? It doesn't matter if you say, but I don't have education, I don't have money. God doesn't need stuff. He speaks things that are not as though they already are. Your faith creates something in the atmosphere. In the name of the Lord, hallelujah, I lose the sword of the Lord in your mouth right now. That if you're facing bankruptcy and you're a tither, we break it in Jesus' name. Every demon spirit that's coming against you, against your children, by the authority of the Holy Ghost, I wield the sword of the Lord across the earth right now. Every nation we call in to the glory of God. We call in the United States of America into liberty by releasing the sword of the Lord. Here's what happened. The Bible said when he said the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. What did he do? He stepped over into the spirit realm. For the weapons of our warfare are not natural weapons. He used faith and he declared when he declared the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, the Bible says, and God made his enemy take their own swords and turn on each other, and they killed each other while Gideon is standing with a little old trumpet, a broken pitcher, and a little lamp in the midnight hour and 299 guys. And the Lord said this, for the battle is not yours, but stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. 
until we get a mindset in this nation as a church that we are not fighting political people. We are not fighting Democrats or Republicans or the Supreme Court. We're not fighting dishonest men and women. We are fighting the powers of darkness. And our weapons, hallelujah, have to be what come out of our mouth. Thank God for prayer meeting yesterday morning. What was going on? We are loosening the sword. You got a room full of men and women that were just walking through the atmosphere going, the sword of the Lord, the sword of the Lord, the sword of the Lord. What were we doing in work? We are wielding the sword of the Lord. What am I doing right now? I am flashing the sword of the Lord over you right now, over this nation, and I am loosening you by the power of God. Because every instance, a spiritual weapon will always defeat a natural weapon. It's no match. Because it's the power of God. In um, 1 Samuel, I must go there a lot because it's the only part of my Bible that's come out of its binding. (laughs) But in 1 Samuel, we know the story of, of David and Goliath. And David is a praiser. But he's also a prophet. The scripture calls him a prophet. He's a praiser. He also can eat the showbread that the priests eat because he has a high priest in his loins. He is so many things. He's a king. He is a general of an army. And here at a young man, his coming out moment. He comes onto the scene, and we know the story. Goliath is intimidating the heck out of Israel. What is he doing? He is speaking a sword declaration. Goliath is. He's speaking it. <clears throat> Saul should be the one drawing his sword. He's the king. He should be leading Israel into battle. But whenever you don't put value on the presence of the Lord, and in his case, the Ark of the Covenant, you won't know anything about, hallelujah, having faith and the presence of God. And Saul, instead of drawing his sword, he tries to give it to somebody else. He looks at David, and David says, I'll go. He doesn't think he has a snowball's chance in the middle of August in Nashville, Tennessee. But he puts his armor on him, straps his sword on the side, and David looks at it. He said, I don't know what these can do. I ain't used them before. Take them off. So here comes David. He is a praiser. He is a prophetic utterance. And he comes unto the scene, and as Goliath sees him, he begins to declare what he's going to do to David. His sword is on his side. And as he gets, he looks at David and said, I'll take your head off. I'll feed you to the birds of the air, the fowls. He said, I, I'm insulted that they would send such a young man after me. What does David do? He does not have any sword in the natural, but he comes with a declaring word of the Lord. He doesn't draw the natural sword. He draws the spirit sword. And he begins to prophesy. He says, all right, you've said what you're going to do. Now let me tell you what I'm going to do. Thus saith the Lord, I'm going to take your head off of your shoulders. I'm going to defeat you before the Israelites and the Philistines. I'm going to let everybody know there's no God in Israel like the God Jehovah. And he said, when the day is over, you're going to be defeated. What was he doing? He got a hold of a sword called the Word 
word of God in the midst of an impossible situation when it looked like it could never come up. David was going, I, this is what God's saying. This is what God's saying. This is what God's saying. And the rock of ages came out of that sling and hit Goliath in the head and he fell down dead. What went on? It was a spirit sword that took on a natural sword and in the spirit of the Lord today there is a spiritual sword being wielded in this nation. I don't care what CNN says. I don't care what MSNBC says. I don't care what Apple News said. All I know is that the word was long before they ever existed and the word of God says in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The word says there shall be light in the evening time. The word says I'm coming back for a glorious church without spot, wrinkle or blemish that we are going to triumph by the power of the Holy Ghost that unprecedented healings, unprecedented deliverance, unprecedented glory, mammoth crowds in the bridgestone praising the name of the Lord. And here's what the world does not understand. Is any time the word, the sword, comes out of your mouth and defeats your enemy, then will God will take the enemy's own weapons and kill them. And David with a sword declared what he was going to do. He went over, picked up Goliath's sword that should have had the blood of David on it from cutting his head off. And David cuts Goliath's head off. I wondered why he did that. I think this is why. Because the head had the mouth and the tongue in it that was making all the insinuating, intimidating remarks. And David cut it off brought the head back to Jerusalem and gave the sword to the priest. Now, this is what happens if you won't use the word of God. Saul should have used the sword of the Lord. He would not draw his sword. So, not too long after that, in the 31st chapter, I think it's 1 Samuel, the Bible said that there was war with the Philistines. Saul went to battle, and he was severely wounded. And he looked at his armor bearer, and he said, kill me so they don't come and kill me. And his armor bearer would not. And the Bible said that Saul took his own sword that should have cut the head of Goliath off. And his own sword killed him. Then the Bible says, now remember, David took Goliath's head back to Jerusalem to the temple and the sword. The Philistines found Saul, cut off his head, took his armor, took it back to their god, Ashtaroth, and put his head and his sword in their temple. You either use the word of God or the enemy will take your own weapon and he will make you fall on your own sword. And this is why so many Christians allow the enemy with the sword of their mouth to say, well, I don't think it's ever going to get any better. Can I pray for you? Well, yeah, but, you know, I just, I just don't know if God can do it. What are they doing? They are pulling. The enemy has pulled their sword. And he is killing them with the sword of their own mouth. Because there's life and death in the power of your tongue. Why? That's why James says, Behold how great a fire the tongue 
can set on fire. The word kindle means a forest. He said, remember how great of a forest the tongue can set on fire. What was he declaring? That the sword, hallelujah, can burn down the house of the enemy if you get a hold of the sword of the Lord. I don't care what's going on in your life. My son that did communion today, Holy Ghost filled, powerful man of God, does a great teaching on deliverance. But all those years he was gay and had a partner. God would tell you this, and the enemy would heal. I'd have Christians come and tell me well you're just born that way well you know God that's just some people were just like that and I have a crusade gay people don't get delivered if you get offended so be it all I know is when he was born I laid hands on him and I dedicated him to the Lord And I watched him get filled with the Holy Ghost when he was eight years old. I think he was eight. And I refused to watch the devil charge me with secular humanism and the mentality of psychiatrists and psychologists that say this is the way it is. All I know is that God said, hallelujah, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So we would go to prayer and I would say in the name of Jesus, I bind this demon spirit off of my son and I command it to leave him. Today he's on fire, full of the Holy Ghost, married, got children. You watch what God can do. Can I tell you, there is no rock like my rock. There is no God like my God. Some of you need to rise up in the Holy Ghost. Shake off these heavy bands and begin to declare, my God said it. Wield your sword. Wield your sword. Attack your enemy and bring him down by the power of God. Hãy subscribe cho